on its side. Would you agree if you have a function Um, let's say h, that happens to be differentiable, would you agree that at its local maximum, that's where the slope is 0? h prime here is 0. Would you agree that it happens at the local maximum? Well, why did, why does, did that not happen here? The h, at the local maximum, h prime does not exist, right? So somehow the existence of the derivative is going to help me, yes? And what can you say about a local maximum? So let's write this down and as you think about it. If h uh, uh, on AB has a local max at AB at some point C inside AB, closed AB, and h prime exists, h prime of c exists, then I claim h prime must of c must be 0. That's my claim. Yes? OK. Well, this is actually not bad, not hard to show. Here's the idea of the proof. Just take a look at what you're taking the limit of. Look, suppose I look at h of t minus h of c and compare that to t minus c. If h has a local maximum at the point c, what has to be true about, let's say, h of t minus h of c, no matter which side I'm on? If it has a local maximum at, a, at c, this thing's going to be what? Negative. It has to be negative because C is a local maximum. Yes? OK. But now, what's the, what about the bottom? Well, on the bottom, it depends on which side you're on, yes? So would you agree, if you examine this creature, this thing could be positive or negative, but the top is always negative. So what you see is that this thing is going to be, the whole thing is going to be negative on the right, you know, if t is bigger than c, and it's going to be positive on the left if t is less than c, yes? So we're taking the limit of this, a bunch of positive numbers on the right, uh, left, a bunch of negative numbers on the right, and if that limit exists, what has to be true? Well, the left and the right-hand limits have to be exist and be equal. So if you take the limit of a bunch of positive numbers, what's the only values that can be? Zero or bigger. And if you take the limit of a bunch of negative numbers, that can only be zero or smaller. So what's the only thing this derivative could be if it exists? Zero. That's the argument. So. Um, it's negative on the right, so since the left limit and the right limit uh, exist and are equal, the limit must be 0. OK. Everybody happy with that? That's a simple version of, um, of uh, uh, I think this is called Rollet's theorem. Okay, something like that. Okay, great. Now, suppose that is true. Um, how will this enable me to prove the general, to prove the mean value theorem? Well, how is this picture kind of like this picture? Yeah, it's a little, just a little off. So really, if I wanted to do this to uh, apply uh, this mini result to a general picture, I should just take the function and subtract off the function that is the what? Secant line. And then you get a new function, let's call it h, that has the requisite properties. Okay, that's the idea. Now, I just said that in words. 
uh, and you can, you can carry that out. What I do want to do instead is actually prove something a little more general since we have the machinery. And this is called the generalized mean value theorem, which says the following. If f of x and g of x are continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval, then there exists a point in between, let's call it C, so that what? f of b minus f of a times g prime of c equals g of b minus g of a times f prime at c. And I want you to notice again that this point C, I don't know anything about except it's in the interval somewhere, uh, appears on both sides of this equation. Why is this called the generalized mean value theorem? Yeah, g could be, g of x could be x. And if you do that, you get the regular mean value theorem. So notice, if g of x equals x, we get the mean value theorem. Because the derivative is 1, and this is, becomes b minus a. So let me prove the generalized mean value theorem. Uh, and uh, we'll use um, our first observation. Number one, many observation one. Okay. So here's the idea. Again, the book doesn't do this, but it, it, it will motivate uh, the proof uh, nicely. So the idea is the following. Suppose I have a, um, oh, I don't know, suppose I have a cake here. Okay, this is a piece of cake. And, um, Let's suppose that I um, uh, that I have a knife that's going to sweep over the cake, like so, left to right. Okay. And the position of the knife is given by the left to right knife. The position of this knife is given by a function f. So this tells me where the, the knife is. Okay. And it's going, it maybe doesn't even go left or right, but the point is the position of the knife is given by this. But you can imagine sweeping it from one side to the other. Okay? So that at time A, the um, position of the knife is at f at A, and at time B, the position of the knife is at f of B. Okay? And it's moving around, yes? Suppose simultaneously I have another knife whose position is given by g of t. Uh, also, at time a, it's at the bottom, and at time b, it's at the top. OK. OK, so this is the knife. I'll call this knife big A. Uh, I'll call this knife k and call this knife l. OK. OK. Well, let's see. I claim in this particular uh, expression, let's call this expression Cyclops Smiley, I claim that the left-hand side of Cyclops Smiley represents what? Well, I claim that this is the rate, if I look at f of b minus f of a, that is this distance, yes, times well, g prime of c is the rate at which this knife is sweeping out length. So this product is the rate at which the area gets swept out. It's the rate of, of uh, rate uh, that a uh, that knife l sweeps out area sweeps out area of cake. Similarly, the right hand side of Smiley, Cyclops Smiley, is the rate that, well, let's see, it's g of b minus g of a, so that's this width times the rate of change that the knife is moving.